Welcome to our UCSF COVID lecture series for today. My name is Divya Jay, and I'm going to be talking to you about sexually transmitted diseases. I want to thank Lindsay Hampton, Michelle, and Christy for organizing this wonderful lecture series that has helped me personally quite a bit learning new things, and I hope to contribute to the same effort. I have no financial disclosures with this regard. My interest with STDs is I'm a reconstructive urologist. I do male and female reconstructive urology and STDs in particular um, disproportionately um, affect underserved populations. Um, and it, it is an, ex in, an extremely important area where we can uh, focus on health literacy and prevention and actually prevent things like chronic pelvic pain and infertility and urethral strictures um, and that's my interest in helping prevent uh, STDs, just like an oncologist would be interested in, in smoking cessation to prevent cancers. It's also important for you because these show up on exams quite often. The overview of this lecture today, we'll talk some of the epidemiology, patient evaluation, uh, the clinical course of some common STDs, screening, prevention, and I have a few question and answers at the end. So why is this important? Some of you may have seen the, this uh, presented in different news articles. It, this is the sixth consecutive year of record-breaking STDs. These are, we have 2.6 million new STDs in 2019 that were reported by the CDC. Um, this is quite alarming, given that this is a completely preventable infection. Um, if other infections were going up at this rate, uh, you know, there would be a lot more publicity and a lot more hue and cry, and this is quite concerning. Complications of STDs, as you know, uh, you can get cancers, infertility, complications from pregnancy, neurological diseases, and death. HIV co-infections with some STDs are very common, and STDs manifest differently in patients living with HIV. Many STDs enhance HIV transmission two to five-fold, so it's very important that we work on understanding, identifying, and prevent, preventing STDs. The epidemiology, like I said, um, in 2015, we had 1.8 million new cases of chlamydia, um, many new cases of gonorrhea and syphilis. Uh, the state of STDs in the United States, it was increasing for, six, for the sixth consecutive year. And this is really concerning. Anyone who has sex with can get an STD, but there are some groups that are more affected. This data coming out right from the STD, from the CDC shows us that young people aged 15 to 24 are at greatest risk, gay and bisexual men, pregnant women, and racial and ethnic minority groups. Many of these are, um, are uh, patients who don't necessarily seek um, or are able to access you know, the best medical treatment. And since we have access to some of these patients, um, we, should, we should do our best in identifying and treating them when we can see them. One in five patients in the United States will have an STD, you know, nearly 68 million infections in 2018. And half of new STDs were among this, these really young, vulnerable uh, population of patients aged 15 to 24. And of course, it has a lot of implications on healthcare and direct costs as well, with it costing about 16 billion in direct medical costs. So many different sectors of society are interested in preventing these. Like I showed you the SD CDC data, Blacks, non-Hispanics, Blacks, um, his, um, Hispanic and Native American persons are disproportionately impacted by STDs. This data is from New York State. However, it mirrors national data. And you can see that in chlamydia, gonorrhea, and early syphilis rates, these um, populations have a disproportionate, um, uh, disproportionately high, uh, are highly impacted by STDs. So why is it that, that we have a, a rise in STDs for six consecutive years? There's multiple reasons why. There is decreased funding in prevention programs and health literacy programs, which needs to change. Uh, testing has changed. We have noticed that there's lower condom use and changes in youth behavior. Um, there's also concern that this, but, but there's potentially because of 
pre-treatment and post-treatment prophylaxis there and advances in HIV treatment, uh, there, are, there may be increased STDs in that population. So let's start with patient evaluation. We as urologists are very comfortable talking about intimate uh, issues with our patients. And you know, starting off with the five Ps, really having an honest discussion with your patient about partners, practices, prevention of pregnancy, protection from STDs and past history of STDs um, is important in any patient that you suspect has an STD. Getting a detailed sexual history, being very specific, what body parts go where, um, using very inclusive language, um, you know, and in being in a very, very open and non-judgmental way. And this is not just for you, but the nursing staff, the NAs, um, the office staff, just being very welcoming and open to patients. Um, understanding if patients are in a very vulnerable financial situation where they have to uh, provide sex in exchange for money or housing or drugs, any prior history of STIs and patients and experience with condoms and contraception, what is their preferred method, if they have any understanding of this, if they're financially able to afford these options. Um, so the next part is very important with being able to identify STDs correctly and understanding their clinical course and treatment of the same. So I like to think about everything in compartments and one easy way to think about STDs is how they present. This might be gross, but if you think of STDs as drips versus sores, it might help you come up with an easy differential when you have somebody in front of you with a presenting problem. You think of the drips, the most common one, gonorrhea, often co-infected with chlamydia, and then you have the non-gonococcal urethritis or cervicitis, uh, trichomonas vaginitis and, vagino and bacterial vaginosis, and we'll talk about the whole differential of the vaginosis vaginitis uh, complex. And among the sores, syphilis is the most common and most dangerous in some ways, genital herpes, um, lymphogranuloma venereum, um, chancoid, and granuloma inguinale. I also want to spend a few minutes on HPV. So let's start with the drips. Um, I will warn you not to maybe watch this lecture during lunch or um, there are some pictures here because I want you to be able to identify these STDs when you see them, apologize for that in advance. So again, your drip differential, gonorrhea, chlamydia, non-gonococcal urethritis or cervicitis, uh, trichomonas and bacterial vaginosis. Gonorrhea is caused by a gram-negative diplococcus, Neisseria gonorrhea. It infects columnar epithelial cells. There's a picture right here on the right uh, of the screen most infections are mucosal. So urethritis, cervicitis, proctitis. Infections may progress and lead to bad complications like ectopic pregnancies, infertility, and chronic pain. This is, this is if it is not treated, also epididymitis. Infections can be disseminate, can disseminate um, in about 0.5 to 3% of untreated mucosal gonorrhea or chlamydia. You may have heard about some of these syndromes like dermatitis arthritis syndrome, endocarditis, meningitis, the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, um, pharyngitis, and proctitis. Diagnostic options um, the, the most common diagnostic option in the past used to be a urethral swab, but you don't have to do that anymore. You can just use a urine sample to perform a nucleic acid amplification test, a gram stain and a culture. Um, so please don't be using the urethral swabs. A urine, urine sample is good enough. Incubation period for gon gonorrhea urethritis is three to seven days. Then asymptomatic infection may occur about 10% of the time, but most of the time these present with dysuria, purulent or mucopurulent discharge. Cervicitis, we as urologists also see women and we should be able to pick up these discharges and diagnose these issues just the same. Um, signs and symptoms also develop in about 10 days. They present in 50% of the cases as vaginal discharge, 
uh, dysuria and vaginal spotting, but it can also just be nonspecific. So performing a good pelvic examination and um, examining patients and testing this vaginal discharge is important. You have probably definitely heard of the increase in multi-drug resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, this is definitely a rising and an increasingly problematic issue. Currently, our treatment um, is with ceftriaxone. You can see the percentage of, multi of drug resistance from ceftriaxone is fairly low, but the drug resistance with antibiotics that used to be used to use, like ciprofloxacin and tetracycline, are really are rising and getting worse. Risk factors for antibiotic resistance, men who have sex with men, commercial sex workers, pharyngeal gonococcus infections and transmission, uh, sex with partners from higher antimicrobial resistance prevalence areas of the world, like East Asia, North Africa, and Middle East. And this is straight from the CDC. So um, the CDC puts out new guidelines, and I will, I will say most of my presentation is from the CDC guidelines. Um, they put out new guidelines every five years. Right now, you're probably familiar with the 2015 guidelines, but I want us to take some time because there have been changes to the 2020 guidelines, and it's really important um, that we uh, understand these changes so we are treating our patients appropriately. The first thing when we are treating gonorrhea is that the CDC is no longer recommending dual antibiotic therapy unless chlamydia cannot be excluded. Um, so that's important. Um, next, we were always treating patients with ceftriaxone doses of 250 milligrams IM times one, but these, these uh, recommendations have changed. Now they're recommending 500 um, if the weight is less than 150 and 1,000 if the weight is greater than 150. And if an alternative therapy is used, as we saw that there, there is very high levels of resistance. So if an alternative therapy is used, then you do need to do a test of cure, meaning you need to bring the patient back and you need to uh, check whether this has been cleared. Um, and for all patients, it's pharyngeal GC because it's very difficult for it, antibiotics don't penetrate that area very easily. Let's talk about the other broad category called non-gonococcal urethritis. Um, about 20 to 40% of all non-gonococcal urethritis is chlamydia. 20 to 30% is from mycoplasma or ureoplasma. And the others are trichomonas, HSV, and unknown varieties. So chlamydia is our second um, bug that we're gonna be talking about. The rates are three times higher in women than in men. And it's highest, again, in this very vulnerable young A population of 15 to 24. Peak incidence in young patients, particularly in women. Um, it is uh, the culprit here is an obligate intracellular bacteria, which is not seen on gram stain. And there is two different types of um, these bacteria that are important to us. Strains D to K cause the pelvic inflammatory disease, which can be very harmful to women, causing ectopic pregnancies and chronic pelvic pain, and urethritis in both men and women. And the strains L to 3 cause lymphogranuloma venereum. This, remember, is not a drip, it's a sore. So we will talk about that later. So the clinical presentation from the strains that I talked to you about, urethritis, cervicitis, all mucosal infections, pharyngitis, proctitis, conjunctivitis, PID, epididymitis, reactive arthritis, and in some patients it can be asymptomatic and can persist without symptoms. Again, you want to perform the nucleic acid amplification test um, for the urethra, vagina, cervix, and urine. And serology is helpful if you are concerned about the sore variety which is the LGV. Urethritis is, is, is symptomatic in the incubation is about five to 10 days. Uh, more than 50% can be asymptomatic in men. Uh, it presents with urethral discharge and dysuria, no or clear mucoid or mucopural, mucopural in discharge. This, these photographs are all from the CDC. The cervicitis, ab about 80% can be asymptomatic, non-specific vaginal discharge or spotting, um, and then the signs can be variable in, in 30 to 50% with cervical discharge, edema, um, cervical ectopy, and friability, as these pictures show. 
The LGV variety, like I told you, is not a, it does not present as a drip, it presents as a sore or an ulcer or papule, also presents with painful inguinal lymphadenopathy, which is often unilateral, proctitis and proctocolitis. It's more common in Asia, Africa, South America and the Caribbean. Um, and I will talk about this uh, again when we talk about the source. Uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. In, so GC can develop into PD and in, in about PID in about 10 to 20 percent. Um, the diagnostic criteria, uterine tenderness, adnexal tenderness, um, and cervical motion tenderness, endocervical discharge, fevers, and lower abdominal pain. And these can have very, very dire consequences, including infertility in 15 to 25 percent of patients and increases your risk of ectopic pregnancy by 7% and also chronic pelvic pain. We all know how difficult chronic pelvic pain can be to treat, so it's just important to diagnose early and treat it early. Treatment of chlamydia, again, um, like I said, the CDC guidelines are changing. Um, in all of our questions and board exams, we've been answering one single dose of oral azithromycin. However, their new guidelines say um, that they are recommending using oral doxycycline, uh, 100 milligrams, two times a day. So let's talk about our second non-gonococcal urethritis. This is a mycoplasma genitalium. This is a bacteria with no cell wall. What I, you know, I found interesting about this is if you don't search, you won't find. There was no clinically useful diagnostic test for this bug until 2019, just two years ago. Um, it infects the epithelial cells of the urogenital tract, causes urethritis, cervicitis, and PID. I have a patient with gross hematuria, um, entire workup was negative, um, and the only positive issue he was, he was positive for mycoplasma um, and has now resolved after treatment of the same. So it, you should have a raised suspicion in cases that fail empiric syndromic treatments and sim symptomatology is co um, comparable to um, chlamydia although many patients can be asymptomatic. And like I told you, my patient, the only symptom he had was gross hematuria. Um, the prevalence is 0.5 to 5% in the general population. Transmission is via penile vaginal and penile anal sex. No evidence for oral genital transmission is present right now. This is also a diagnosis made with nuclear, nucleic acid amplification test. Um, you should contact your lab and see whether this is, is a uh, send out lab. Um, ours is, um, and there is different types of labs that you know you have to find out the procedures that you have with ordering that. The treatment according to CDC is azithromycin one gram or 500 milligrams uh, once followed by 250 milligrams daily for three days. There is again concern for widespread macrolide resistance and and fluoroquinolone resistance as well. Let's talk about our next non-gonococcal urethritis. This is trichomoniasis. This is a protozoal infection. Uh, um, it's a flat, as you can see the picture on the right side, it's flagellated. It adheres to squamous epithelial cells, the urogenital sinus. Prevalence is about 3% in the United States. Again, presents as vaginitis or urethritis and can be asymptomatic. Uh, if you remember the differentials of the vaginitis and vaginosis syndromes, um, trichomonas is considered fishy, um, and most of these infections can actually be asymptomatic. The diagnosis, again, is performed through nucleic acid amplification test, microscopy, or culture. I would recommend um, you should always have this testing kit in your office. It's called the AFIRM and it actually tests for all three. It tests for all the different types of vaginosis and vaginitis, including trichomonas, bacterial vaginitis, and um, yeast. So it's a, a very easy test to perform. Um, the treatment for trichomoniasis is metronidazole, uh, two grams times one, or if the patient is HIV positive, you want to do five milligrams BID for seven days. You also definitely want to treat partners because this is a sexually transmitted infection. So all partners in the preceding 60 days were the CDC. Bacterial vaginosis is also something, it's, it's uh, 
not necessarily transmissible as a sexually transmitted disease. However, it is a sexually transmitted infection, um, sexually caused infection, if you will. It's the most common cause of vaginitis or vaginosis. About 25 to 25% 25 of college students, but 20 to 60% among patients with STDs. Uh, this is basically an overgrowth of Gardenella vagin vaginalis. Um, and again, can have very dire consequences, including premature deliveries, low birth weight. Um, and this is also common after infections, after gynecological procedures. Um, some of us use vaginal packing soaked in flagell or metro gel to try and avoid, prevent some of these issues. Um, remember, it presents with a malodorous, fishy, smelly discharge. And you can see the bacteria here on the slides. Um, if you remember, this is um, the AMSEL criteria, which is you're looking at a thin white discharge, clue cells and microscopy, which I have a picture of on the right side of the, of the screen, uh, vaginal fluid pH greater than 4.5 and a positive whiff test. Good luck to whoever is doing that. The treatment is metronidazole, 500 milligrams PO BID for seven days, um, clindamycin, and you can also use this topical metro, metrodazole gel. Um, and you do not need to treat the partner. So just remembering our differential diagnosis of vaginitis, vaginosis uh, syndromes, um, of course, the bacterial vaginosis and the trichomonas that we talked about, and then and Canada. I'm sure you have patients with urinary tract infections who develop um, candidiasis when or candidal infections of the vagina when you give them antibiotics. This usually presents with edema, erythema, and fissures. They have a whitish dis discharge and a curd-like consistency like cottage cheese. The discharge does not have an order and the vaginal pH is less than 4.4, 4.5. Um, and, the, and the wet, saline wet mount usually shows yeast. And you do not need to treat the partner with this one as well. So this is a nice summary for you to review right before taking any examinations. So we are done talking about the gross drips. Now let's talk about some gross sores. So an easy way when a patient presents with a sore is to think about is this painful or painless? It does not always um, stand true, but it's an easy a differential to think about in your mind. Painless sores are syphilis, LGB, and granuloma inguinale. The painful ones are chancroid and, uh, and herpes simplex. So let's talk about syphilis. I found this really interesting just a day before I was able to diagnose somebody with syphilis. I saw this on Twitter. It's a friendly reminder to all medical providers, no matter what the rash looks like, or what you think it may be, always check for syphilis. There, there's a reason they call it the, the great masquerader. Um, and it's true. The rates of reported cases of, state, of, of syphilis in, in the United States, you can see that it took a big plummet. Uh, and now you can see that in the gray line, it's slowly starting to rise, which is a very concerning trend. Syphilis, there are a couple of stages of syphilis, like the primary and secondary, which do have symptoms. Uh, the primary stage, you, they usually present with a chancre, and the secondary um, with more systemic inf um, issues like a rash, nodules, lesions, etc. However, there is a latent phase. So if you don't treat these two phases, um, the, this, the bug actually stays latent in your body, which is a very dangerous thing because it can lead to them tertiary uh, syphilis, uh, which can basically cause cardiovascular or neurosyphilis and other issues that can um, be very dangerous for the patient. So primary syphilis, um, the incubation period is between 10 and 90 days. Um, it presents early with macules or papules and later with these shankers, clean-based painless indurated ulcers with smooth, firm borders goes unnoticed in, 10, in, in 15 to 30 patients, which is why the whole issue with the asymptomatic latent phase of syphilis is very dangerous. It, it resolves in about one to five weeks and it can be very highly infectious at this stage. These are um, pictures of some of the shankers 
I placed them here even though they're gross because I want you to be able to recognize them. I did recently, you know, somebody sent me a patient with concern for a urethral stricture, but they, I, I was able to diagnose them with syphilis. This is in the female version of the Shankers. And these are all again from the CDC. I appreciate their help with this. Secondary syphilis clinical manifestations are more disseminated. You, um, the spirochetes have now spread all over and it usually takes two to eight weeks after the chancre appears. You see these rashes, these maculopapular rashes in the whole body, especially the, the palms and the soles, um, mucosal patches, the condyloma, the lada, which is highly infectious. Also presents with constitutional symptoms and signs and symptoms resolve in two to 10 weeks. Like I said, these condylomata lata are highly infectious and um, hopefully you're able to look at these images, remember them and diagnose them. These are the rashes that we just discussed. The third phase, which is in some ways the very dangerous phase, all symptoms disappear. So the victim thinks that they are cured. However, if there's been no treatment, the bacterium remains in the body and begins to damage the internal organs. The fourth stage of tertiary syphilis is a result of internal damage from the third stage that shows up many, many years later. 10 to 30 years later, after the initial infection, you can have sudden heart attacks, failure of vision, loss of motor coordination and mental disturbances. So the initial diagnosis, clinical presentation, a dark field of serology, and the treatment is penicillin. I always order this these two tests together, the RPR and TPPA, you should contact your lab to see how they want you, if they want you to proceed with an ELISA, uh, ELISA test first, um, this is from the CDC, um, and then order the RPR or TPPPA, but these are blood tests. So let's talk about our second sore, herpes. And remember this is a um, painful um, superficial vesicular or ulcerative lesion with clean erythematous bases um, can be caused by HSV1 or 2 and transmission through direct contact during asymptomatic shedding. Um, herpes is a gift that keeps giving. It can all this a high risk of recurrence. Um, again, these are images of those platules and in a female as well. This can be very painful. Uh, patients who present with you know, pelvic pain obviously deserve an thorough examination for multiple reasons. This can be one of them. Diagnosis, PCR is the gold standard, antigen detection, cultures, and the Zang smear is something that shows up on in-service examinations. So the initial clinical episode, um, acyclovir, 400 milligrams PO three times daily, um, seven to 10 days. And for recurrence, you know, you should get your infectious diseases uh, physicians involved as well, but acyclovir 800 milligrams PO daily um, would be, and then you can also consider suppressive daily treatment for recurrent infections. LGV, we talked about this briefly when we talked about chlamydia, but I want to show you some more images. This is the sore version of chlamydia, uh, which, which has the strains L1 through 3. Diagnosis culture, nucleic acid amplification test, direct immunofluorescence, serology. This is what the primary lesion can look like. In women, it can present with this genital elef elephantiasis. And the important thing to remember, it is a painless papule. However, the lymphadenopathy can be fairly tender. LGV treatments, doxycycline, 100 milligrams POBID and azithromycin, and you have to make sure you treat the partner. Granuloma inguinale is an infectious disease caused by Klebsiella granulomatis. The diagnosis is tissue biopsy, and it's very difficult to culture. On the right side of the screen are these Donovan bodies um, that have presented on examinations before um, that are diagnostic. These are painless papules that can erode through the skin, causing a non purulent beefy red ulceration. They can be vascular and bleed easily. This, these are versions in a male and a female on the right side. Treatment again is doxycycline and you treat partner if the partner is symptomatic. Shrancroid is caused by hemophilus ducrae 
and the diagnosis is culture. You can see the gram stain right here, the typical bacteria. It is a painful genital ulcer and also has tender, or tender regional lymphadenopathy with this green exudate. Um, exams often give you this cue of kissing lesions on the, on the thighs um, and they want you to try and guess this answer. These are some images of this, of this infection. The treatment here is azithromycin or ceftriaxone, and you definitely want to treat partners irrespective of whether they're symptomatic in the last 60 days. So others that don't necessarily neatly fit into our categories of sores versus drips, the other important one is HPV. Human papilloma virus, which can call gen genital herd or condylomata accumulata, uh, is very highly prevalent. More than 50% of sexually active women have been infected with one or more of these types of, H of HPV. 15% have current infections and 50 to 75% are high risk. The causative agent is this double-stranded DNA virus, HPV, which has more than 30 types, but really four are more important. The high-risk types, 16 and 18, 70% cause cervical cancers, vulvar, vaginal, anal and upper tract cancers. And the no risk types, six and 11, cause genital warts, low grade dysplasia, and verruca is carcinoma. These are some images, again, of the, uh, of the warts, very anal warts. And anytime you diagnose this, you have to make sure you're looking at all cavities, so the old versions of these as well, and the penile warts, which is probably the most common thing that we would see. Treatment, um, you can biopsy if you're uncertain because you always want to make sure you're not missing something more dangerous like a penile uh, malignancy. Um, and then excision of exophytic or, or symptomatic wards. You don't have to treat these if, they, if these are not symptomatic. Excision does not actually eradicate the HPV itself, but it helps the patient with their symptoms. There are also topical options. Um, Photophilox is actually a anti-mitotic agent. Um, and then cynic catechins are um, actually a green tea extract, which I thought was interesting. You can also use cryotherapy, which I'm sure most of us have done in training and otherwise, and um, chemical coagulation to treat these. It's very important that we work on vaccinating patients so we reduce these cancers and warts. Um, this is directly from the CDC website. They recommend first dose at age 11 to 12, and the second dose six to 12 months after the first dose has been completed. There's two different types of HPV vaccines, GSK and Merck, um, and efficiency is approximately 100% against precancerous lesions caused by specific types in the vaccine. You can also prevent HPV by decreasing the number of partners, condom use, um, and smoking cessation is also something that's strongly encouraged. So I want to spend a second with the CDC guideline update. Uh, like I told you, they, are, they update these guidelines every five years. However, there are some interesting updates in the you know, 2021 update that they're working on, which I thought was very interesting. Um, so in, previously, they don't always recommend a test of cure. However, now they are emphasizing on retesting uh, in patients who have had STDs, retesting in about three months after treatment due to high reinfection rates. Um, this is good in many ways because you have more contact with these patients if they decide to come back for their appointments um, and you can continue to educate them on preventing further infections and, and treating these infections as soon as they show up, even if they're asymptomatic, so that the patient does not have long-term issues like you know, chronic pelvic pain and infertility, strictures, etc. Um, there is an increased resistance patterns that we're seeing. So testing and, and providing cultures and resistance testing whenever possible. There's an expanded focus on prevention and attention to prioritizing special populations. What I thought was great was that they are recommending screening in trans and gender diverse populations. And there are specific guidelines now on patients who have undergone um, gender affirmation surgery, 
who have new vaginas um, and specific guidelines on how to treat them and, uh, and screen. Uh, syphilis screening and monitoring in pregnancy and extra genital chlamydia and gonorrhea in female adolescent patients. Discussion of sexually transmitted diseases in patients who are using pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis in the men who have sex with men population. And HIV testing for all of those who present with genital or perianal ulcers. They also have a large section on expedited partner therapy. This is when you don't actually have to see the partner, you just provide either a script form or the actual medications, the antibiotics to the patient to provide to the partner um, when they present with an STD. It's recommended by the STD since 2006 and three randomized control trials uh, have shown improved partner treatment and decreased reinfection rates for the patient itself. This is ideal for patients who are embarrassed and who don't, who are unlikely to seek care. Okay, for obvious reasons, you need to exclude patients um, with, you know, where you're concerned about child abuse or sexual abuse or assault. Um, and in an index patient with a syphilis co-infection, and you have to be very cautious if the partner is actually pregnant, you need to make sure you answer, ask all those questions and provide the partner with information about the medication that they're taking and of course, education about preventing these infections in the future. I have left this here, I'm not gonna go over it, but this actually tells you what treatment you should provide for the expedited partner therapy. And you can review this before your exams or if you have a patient who presents with this situation. Screening, this is the CDC guidelines on whom to screen. Um, sexually active people living with HIV at least annually. So all patients with a new HIV infection as well. Sexually active men who have sex with men at least annually and every three to six months if they're at an increased risk. Patients who inject drugs or other drug use. Patients with prior or current STD diagnosis. Um, and patients with multiple anonymous partners. This is a little bit vague, right? You're not, um, but you know, it's something to consider. Um, sex or needle sharing partners of individuals who have HIV or STDs, um, par persons who whose partners fall into any of these categories, pregnant individuals in the first prenatal visit and during the third trimester, all because of congenital transmission, all sexually active individuals under the age of 25 should be tested for uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia at least annually. STD exposure. So if you have an asymptomatic patient with an STD exposure, what do you do? As with any patient, you will do a thorough gentle examination and look for any discharges or sores, as we have learned today. Um, you want to test for HIV, Hep B, syphilis, HSV, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. We have a lot of power as urologists. We are very comfortable talking about some of these intimate issues, and we also have access to some of the more vulnerable populations. We can do a lot with trying to prevent STDs in the future by talking to patients, by testing them, treating them and trying to increase awareness of the complications that they can have in the future so that they are adherent to the testing protocols and treatment protocols and also encouraging treatment of the partners. So that's my talk. I have included a few questions from the um, the CSAP questions, just to see if this might be helpful to you. After seeing that very jarring picture of condyloma dilata, I'm sure you will always recognize that it is secondary from, that is secondary syphilis. 22-year-old um, female um, complains of vulvo vaginal itching and flu-like symptoms. On physical examination, she's afebrile, and the only finding is a fissure in the left labia majora with no vaginal discharge. Your analysis is negative. The treatment that can prevent recurrence of this, this you should recognize is HSV and is oral acyclovir. 26 year old sexually active man has a painful one centimeter solitary ulcer on the glands penis, which is positive um, for L. Duquesne. And the next step you should, you should remember before your examinations is azithromycin 
and a 32-year-old female complains of malodorous fishy vaginal discharge. She's a single male partner, which they're trying to imply to you that she's low risk and uses an intrauterine device for contraception. And you should be able to recognize that this should be just metronidazole for the patient for her BV. We do not need to treat the partner. I have one more. It's the 19-year-old woman who presented with, who was treated with ampicillin for a UTI, develops a pure groin rash. Um, physical examination reveals poorly marginated red patches on her inner thighs, inguinal folds, and labia. Satellite papules and pustules are scattered at the periphery of the inflammatory process. Most likely diagnosis is candidiasis. A 24-year-old sexually active homosexual man with solitary erythematous nodules on the penile shaft he does not have urethral discharge. Purine materials expressed from the nodule and culture on a Thayer Martin medium reveals oxidate positive colonies. Most likely diagnosis is gonorrhea. So this is our QR code to help us share your thoughts about our talk today. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to present.